Okay, I stopped. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. stream this week we've got eric des moines are treasury interest payments really adding to aggregate demand so much so that it's inflationary find out next be kind stay safe and enjoy the show everybody we've got another episode in Stephen friends i'm your host daniel sanderson and uh want to welcome everybody to the live stream what does a live stream mean to everybody well it means engagement it means uh putting your questions into the chat it means following liking all that good stuff the main thing that we want to see from everybody is engagement so let's participate in the show we're glad to have steve here and we're also glad to have eric Taimoin to the show he's an associate professor and Personally, I'm really excited to talk to him about financing um, and the finance industry. Uh, I had a quick look through his um, his page on, on his academic page, and he's actually teaching um, uh, the the deficit myth. He's including it in a curriculum, so I hope to talk a little bit about that. But first, I'm actually wanting to talk about a very contentious and uh, uh, abrasive issue, I guess, that came up on Twitter. That's right. Something came up on Twitter from, I'd like to say my good friend, friend Nassim Taleb, but quite honestly, I think he hates everybody. Um, years ago, uh, there, was, um, there was a move on his part, I think, to uh, almost like a, uh, like somewhat like a, a young child kind of like that needed to be spanked or something like this. He has a way of reaching out and scolding ac academics. Now, whether it's justified or not, I know there was a backlash. Years ago, I published or uh, I republished something from Steven Pinker on Planksit. I asked Steven Pinker whether I could republish it, and he, he, he thought that was completely fine. Basically, it was the, um, the belligerence of N Nassim Taleb. So maybe we're going to tease out that a little bit. Um, Taleb's kind of a funny person because he, he seems to have some merit to his arguments, but he has, he has no qualms about just taking down and causing as much ruckus as he can and insulting whoever he can. So there's absolutely no respect, I think, in his circles of, of outreach on social media, which uh, seems to be replicating quite well. Um, on that, I'd like to bring Steve 
into the conversation. My good friend, Steve, why don't you come and join us and let's do a little bit of Taleb bashing to start off the show, Steve. <laughs> Happy to do that. Yeah, yeah. Good day, mate. <laughs> so I, you know, before we bring up the graphic, I mean, I remember creating a graphic around Taleb and I, I actually created the bell curve and I had this like, Fat man. <laughs> yeah. Now you could say it was Taleb, but I'm going to say maybe it's not. He actually has this. I know. He, he, he used to have a little. I mean, I'm quite. Because I used to do Olympic weightlifting as a sport, not on the Olympics, uh, I keep. I definitely registered his little thing. Do you even lift? Question mark, which is part of his bio. So he's in oh, weightlifting. Okay. Deadlifting. So he wouldn't be a fat man. He's a big man, but not a fat man. He's a big man. I like his persona that he has in some of his writings called Fat Tony, right? And I, I put this I like Fat him. Tony next to Socrates and this and that. And what he's really doing is trying to idolize somebody and saying, you know what? All these academics got it wrong. It's this this uh, everyday kind of gangster like guy that kind of gets the under in, intuitive understanding of economics and money and yeah. markets and all that sort of stuff that you lowly academic types just can't participate in you're missing the boat sort of thing right and yeah. um mm. i created this graphic where well hold on a sec pull, pull that down for a sec so i created this graphic <laughs> so i created this crap this graphic where you have the bell curve right yeah and that's his big criticism so it's this fat man jumping on the bell curve <laughs> okay. and what that's happens is the bell curve kind of goes and it it, it, it kind of pushes out at the sides and i i always like that idea because it, it, it leaves more room for the extremophiles or the things out on the, you know, on the peripheral of, of, of the curve, right? So, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, I think there's some merit to that. I think there's some oh, there's, merit there's a, to... There's a, huge, there's a huge amount of merit. And he certainly wasn't the first one to point out the existence of fat tails, uh, but he's the one who popularized the concept in the public, and that's quite a worthwhile thing to do. And he's certainly also a good, damn good mathematician, so he can handle the mathematics involved in all of this. But the basic thing about a Gaussian distribution is uh, that's fundamentally you have a uh, filled by randomness is not another one of his you know, rather useful uh, books. But if you have a if you have something a, a system which is not affected, one instance doesn't affect another. So my height doesn't affect your height, for example. Uh, then what you'll get when you measure the height of all individuals is a bell curve. Okay? There'll be an average and there'll be a, a standard deviation around that. And if you're within one standard deviation, that's 68% of the population. Two, I think it's 95. Three, it's 99.7. And when you get yeah. out to five standard deviations, there's just a you know, one in a billion chance of somebody being that tall. And you hit six or seven, it just won't happen. So it, it, it lets you give, uh, um, you know, a, a, a very... It gives you a lot of precision in using statistical analysis, and it also means that you can rule out particular events as just being impossible. Now, to give you an idea of how wrong that is when you apply it to um, stock markets, the the uh, stock market crash in 2007 as part of the whole you know, global financial crisis was 25 standard deviations away. And if you were using the type wow. of thinking which mainstream mainstream finances encourage you to believe that it is a random walk and that it is driven by you know everything's driven by future value of uh, investments coming in over time. That's what sets the stock market. No causal thing. Well, this twenty five standard deviations cannot happen. Oh shit! It happened. And you go back to history and look at the scale of what happened back in the Great Depression, the stock market crash. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Then, you know, the, yeah, this was all bullshit. And Taleb was quite right to call it bullshit. But I think mm. he calls, he's, he has a tendency to call anything bullshit that he, uh, the way where he's not pontificating and saying what's correct. And he was the one spouting bullshit a couple of days ago, which uh, <laughs> yeah. had absolutely yeah. no impact upon me because I fucking expected it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've been blocked from Taleb for years. I think it was because I Have followed. Stephen Pinker, I think he like just went and found all the followers and blocked them. I can't, I can't. I'll check and see. Huh? Uh, yeah, no, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm blocked yet. I have to check. Oh, you're, you're, you're fun. You're, you're, uh, you're cannon fodder for some, some good arguments, right? And uh, well, he, that's what he might think. Yeah, let's have to wait and see. Eh? So if I can search for Taleb here on my other, other well, screen, let's see. Yeah, while we uh, haven't been trashed yet. Yeah, yeah. While we um, 
what I want to do next is I want to bring on now I want to I want to tell you guys there's there was a challenge for anybody that didn't show up last week and it wasn't last week it was a week before because we had last week mm. off but anybody that did show up two weeks ago I we had kind of a little game going on with Mike Radzicki and okay he, we we challenged him he had to wear a hat of course, yeah, that's right with the numbers, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. So let's bring uh -huh. on, let's bring on Mike Radzicki, and he, we're going to get him to read. What? <laughs> okay, it was over the top. Oh, yeah. holy shit! Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe he's got a, he's got. Look at the bright future. He's got such a bright I, future. I he love, just I love the, sun, the sunglasses as well. No, that's not a MAGA hat, is it? Is it, Mike? It has this no, red. No, no, no. This is um. This is my hat and sunglasses from the Ryder Cup that was held, not the most recent one, but the one before it that was held about 10 minutes from where I went to high school at Whistling Straits, Wisconsin. And so all the European folks are in their full Euro gear. So my son got us Yanks. All American, all American, American, American. Right. You're very good. Okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> it looks to make it a funny hat so this is it's the, definitely the, corny you will be well and truly scored okay and the sunglasses yeah. you get extra extra but I'm, i might be forced to wear something yeah, myself next match. week with that particular yeah. achievement yeah you got it you got it mike so my question is is do you think that's going to hinder you or help you uh in reading the top chatters list i i'm it curious keeps the brain waves in uh, uh i'm waiting for um actually i think it repels the brain waves more likely but still so. until then mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, just so the, that the listeners know, the the hat itself is actually lined uh, with tin foil. So that's how he's able to do that, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, top chatters, Mike. You're gonna knock it out of the park. Oh yeah, there's more every time we do this. Uh, John uh, Troughton, Bruce Constadine, uh, Marilyn Haywood, Page, Teresa Sanders, Frankfurt Z, Richard X O'Brien, Nick. Ballesteros, Mohammed Furkan Maksud, Around the Wicket, Gunnell 1972, The Hasty Ent, Steve Fitt, Danger Zone, Christopher Dobby, Big Hammer, Guy Ewoks, uh, Larry Summers, Wayne McMillan, Dave Wilkie, Channel Math, Mandy Morehall, Tony Wilson, not Tony Wilson, Syndicat, Steve Frith, hello, Internets, Berth Lorenz, Dave Crossland, Jim Roberts, Folk for America, Positive Economic Reform Ideas. There you go. The Atheist Paladin, Tony Wilson. <laughs> there, I guess not, I get it now. Matthias <laughs> Steven, Economics in One Lesson, Douglas Dowell, JD, Dreg Eye, Jens Runberg, Petrified Produce, Yuck, Lana Duh, it's the clock, love that name. She watches, NG. Pat Brannigan, Potato Sack, uh, Philippe Burns, Botch Mandela, Apple Scab, uh, uh, Tony Richards, Ghost on the Half Shell, TR, Sophia Aris, Bauhaus, Algorithm, Political Economy 101, D. Bruce, and Creative Global Funding Service. Jeez. Oh, man. Uh, no. I thought it was oh, pretty good. Jeez, oh, Louis, sorry, like Wait, you, you, Brian, Mary you, Heyman. It's the sunglasses. Philadelphia. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I thought I thought I thought you did actually pretty good. And like, you know, where would the the failure horn come from? I don't know, but I do want to point out. I've done this a couple times. If and we want us as friends, okay? So, guy, e walks or whatever you say. <laughs> like, I chuckled to myself because it's tough to be on there, right? But it's. Yeah. It's Guy Folks, F A W K E S, and he is a historical figure with that uh, uh, the London gunpowder yeah, thing that he put under the yeah. the, the Parliament. Guy, he has Fol that silly Guy Folks Day. Guy Folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try yeah, to yeah, blow yeah. up the British Parliament. Because yeah, one, yeah. one of the great, we should actually mention this now, in fact, he failed to blow up the British Parliament, but later the British Parliament succeeded in burning itself down because they decided to burn all the tally six. And that's one uh, with a classic story. The, the person who was given the job set them in fire in the basement of uh, Westminster Palace, which is the house, the house of uh, House of Lords, House of, of Commons, but both buildings together. In 1836, I think it was, and the fire got out of control and burnt the building to the ground. So that's the revenge of credit on people who believe money is gold. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, before we bring Eric on, I want to ask you, Mike. 
Um, are you familiar with any of Taleb's stuff? Because I think we should, oh, yeah. you know, delve into this tweet and we should really look at, mm -hmm. I, I mean, it was even, you know, perusing Steve Keen's uh, Wikipedia page and there's now a section. I have to say it's actually much better. Yeah. Well, the Wikipedia page, Steve, have a look at it. Remember back in the day when we yeah, first okay. started doing some things together, it was horribly written in the first part of the Steve Keen page. Like it was... It, oh. it, it was almost like the example of the, what not to do for an academic, but there was some, like, I don't know, people watching it that were blocking it that weren't allowing you to check, actually make a fair Wikipedia page, right, basically. And, and it, sometimes okay. it's hard to change. There's a couple of criticisms down below, which, I, you know, I mean, I think we should maybe, you know, look at that and say, are these valid criticisms? Probably not, but I think the art of criticism is something that is valuable, and it's it shouldn't be a takedown culture. It should be like, is there anything in that that you know can resonate with how to improve your work, right? So I'm curious. And then mm. from Mike's perspective, well, you look at that, Steve. Mike, what is it that you know about Taleb, and what do you think his um, his his contribution is? Is it is it lock, stock, and barrel all in the financial sector of the of, of, of the economy? Well, you know, the black swan event thing, the fat tail thing, um, you know, he brought it to the public's consciousness, and it's a good thing that um, these, uh, you know, thousand-year one-time events happen more often than people think. People's mental models maybe don't, you know, uh, know that, and so that that's a good thing. From my perspective, the way I was raised as a young academic pup by uh, Jay Forrester in the system dynamics crowd, is that, uh, yeah, th that systems are shocked by random uh, events all the time. And it's useless to try and predict when the next shock, which is shocking by definition, which you don't expect it, mm -hmm. when it's going to come, it's rather you should redesign your system, redesign your airplane, your economy, your state, your family, your, your business, your university, whatever, so that it can withstand these shocks big and small whenever they occur so um forrester used to say think of um your let's say company and your competitors companies are boats floating on the ocean and the ocean is going up and down and all over the place and if your boat is well designed you're going to be bobbing on the surface right and and doing okay at least relative to your competitors and your competitors are going to be listing and sinking and what have you. So try to, rather than trying to predict when the next wave is going to push you this way or that way, you should be redesigning your boat, your system, so that no matter when you get shocked with black swan events or what have you, your system uh, can adequately, you know, deal with them and keep things stable and under control and, and what have you. So in, in a yeah, nutshell, I mean, that's kind of how I think about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the thing. I'd actually most likely he's done recently because, like, the, his stuff on on uh, on uh, black swans and so on. Two things I can say about that. One is that that was actually uh, bringing to the surface a lot of literature in the economy physics area, talking about power law distributions and the fact that mm -hmm. stock markets weren't if it weren't Gaussian, they were power law systems yeah, yeah, like right, earthquakes, yeah. like many many other issues like that. So it was a worthwhile. It was bringing something forward as a contribution, which was already there in the literature, but making it popular. And that's that yes. itself was extremely worthwhile. Uh, he, he, the financial crisis was not a black swan. It was something which is a black swan if you had the wrong theory, which 98% of economists have, uh, which ignores the role of uh, Minsky's financial instability hypothesis fundamentally. So I was one of the handful who predicted it within economics because I, Minsky's framework is my framework, and this was inevitable in Minsky's if you allow the level of private debt to continue rising compared to GDP. So I didn't see that as a black swan incident, but the black issues of black swans themselves are quite worthwhile. With the power law distribution, rather than a Gaussian, things which you can rule out with a Gaussian will happen regularly with a black with a with a with a power law distribution. But yeah. the thing he's done most that I most likely have done recently, Mike, is similar to what you were saying a moment ago, is he's coined the term anti fragile fragile. Mm. And he said that you should try to make sure your systems are anti-fragile. And that mm -hmm. I think is a very, that's something which I think is a term which is his and his alone. And that's mm -hmm. quite a decent contribution. At the same yeah. time, as somebody said earlier, he's a dickhead. And his first yeah. response to being criticized is to kick back and call me, in my particular case, a fucking idiot, which is so, fine. But unfortunately, as you know, I can't fuck anymore. So I must just be an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> 
So <laughs> we won't get into that. We won't get into uh, that. Okay. This, yeah, right. this, this show does not. Well, I mean, hey, and there's no there's no rules for this show. Suppose we can get into almost anything. Um, but let's bring on the guest. So we got Eric. Come on in. Let's 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 hear what you have to say about <laughs> anti fragility because we're kind of moving this we're moving the conversation forward, right? Anti fragility, Eric. What do you got for us on on anti fragility and 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 Mr. Taleb? What do you what do you got for us? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think um, actually uh, I'm, a, I'm more of the view that this uh, view that the uh, uh, black swan. Uh, became popular, created this service to us, actually, because uh, it popularized further the view that the financial crisis was a one-off event, uh, what the Greenspan call a uh, uh, once-in-a-century tsunami, and it's a law of nature, and we could not do anything about it, and that happens. We tried, but unfortunately, events uh, were so dramatic that uh, whatever regulation we had put on in terms of capital regulation, it would never have worked. And I think uh, what we what we see in terms of uh, Minsky, as Steve was saying, is that uh, really the, the issue is more one of fragility, okay? And um, for Minsky, it's not an uh, unusually, unusually large event that creates problem. It's the fact that the system becomes uh, sensitive to even tiny uh, deviations. So if we take the financial crisis of 2008, if you look at the financial structure of securitization, some, um, some schemes there were uh, basically bankrupt just by a 0.5% uh, default rate on mortgages. Okay, and the entire structure collapsed. And um, so 0.5% default rate is very, very normal okay so you ch you flip the narrative with minsky you don't look yeah. at extreme events you look at tiny events that creates uh, large problems because the underlying underlying structure is very fragile and so what you want to study is more over time how the f the structure becomes more and more fragile that's nice that's introduction true. yeah that's yeah good. that's very I, very I good the point system was designed not not necessarily consciously but designed to collapse like that uh, we'd mm -hmm. say there's a, there was a, a latent structure of a where there's a, a shift in feedback loop dominance where there can be a, an abrupt you know collapse like that and it's due to the, to the way the system is designed the design of the airplane and like i say it wasn't necessarily consciously de de uh, designed that way Think of the United States tax code. No one in their right mind would design it the way it is from scratch. It's crazy, right? It's evolved. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. pre present design. It's present structure. So whether it was consciously designed or not, it's irrelevant. It's, it has a particular structure. It's evolved that way over time. The, the banking system and, and all its interconnections and what have you, the incentives to you know make mortgages and, 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 and what not necessarily um, manage them on and on, and guess what? Inside of there was a the ability to have a shift in feedback loop dominance, and we don't know exactly when, but when it hits, yeah, it flips over. Right? Yeah, and, and that I that, think that, the, yeah the um, the uh, the important points, as you guys said, is that prediction uh, of the timeness of even is really irrelevant. The example I always take because people always when I talk about financial crisis, people ask me, well, when is the next one then? Well, the example I always take is. Okay, when you go to see your mechanic uh, to check your car, okay, and your mechanics come back and tells you, okay, well, you need to change your brakes here because they're going to fail uh, pretty soon. But the next question you're going to ask is not, well, when exactly are gonna br the brakes fail? Is it next day? Uh, can you give me a precise timing? No, what he's just telling you is that overall your brakes are, are, are worn and you need to change them. When it's going to fail, we don't know but you have a condition here on your car that needs to be changed and you need to do it now because it's dangerous. And so applying that to the, the uh, financial crisis is, uh, yeah, things may be going great. Uh, may, people are making a lot of money flipping houses or uh, as the argument was going on in on, on Senate is people are accessing a house and so uh, we should let it go. Well, no, you should kill it right away because you can see that it's actually uns unsustainable. Now, of course, you 
come in uh, the consequences, you have to go against a lot of interest, people accessing your home that they were going to be able to hold for three months or less, but uh, or the people that are engaged in financial practices, households and others that are uh, profitable now, but are not sustainable. All this should be checked uh, right away. Actually. Okay. okay and I, I, the I guiding that, principle, yeah. if you follow Minsky, is you promote hedge finance. Okay. Yeah. That's what you want. And you do. don't let private debt levels get too high. This is why I don't regard the black the financial crisis as a black swan. It's a black eye for anybody who believes in conventional finance. But if you right. look at the level of level of private debt compared to GDP and the rate of growth of that ratio, that's why I said the crisis is inevitable. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the question of what the timing was difficult, but then I could even say, look, it's going to happen soon. So I think mm -hmm. a, a better a better analogy for a, a genuine black swan event is an earthquake. Because uh, and even there, there's um, nuances to it. Because with an earthquake, you there is virtually there is actually pretty much no limit to how large an earthquake can be, uh, and you have a the actual Richter scale we use for it is a power law system. It's uh, uh, each 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 one up the scale is means that I think. I don't, I'm not an expert, so I'm, I'm going for what I remember reading, 16 times the previous level. So an earthquake of scale one is six, is uh, two is 16 times scale one, and three is 16 times, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you plot the, the distribution, the, the num number of earthquakes, uh, the scale of earthquakes on the horizontal axis, and the, the log of the number of earthquakes of that scale on the vertical, you get virtually a perfect straight line correlation, and that's your power law. And But what it means is, in a region which is susceptible to earthquakes in particular, you don't know whether you're going to get a scale one or a scale nine, okay? It, that's the black swan side of it. But then it, again, at the same time, you know if you're living near a tectonic plate edge, which we now know exists, then absolute maximum 8.9. I think we actually had a nine or a 9.2 uh, back in, when Japan's quake uh, ghost. I, yeah. I think you might be wrong there. Um, but but that you know it's going to be more likely to be far more likely to be when you're on a tectonic plate edge than elsewhere and we also yeah. know that because plates are moving the, the length of time from the last big one makes the next big one more likely okay mm -hmm. so there's elements even of predictability to, to black swan events uh but you know no way was the financial sector of uh, the crisis of a, a black swan it was a black eye for conventional finance interesting yeah, Mike? I think I think yeah. From a from a complex systems point of view, what we try to do for policy is to add negative feedback loops to mm -hmm. uh, stabilize unstable systems. Yeah. So the basic Keynesian one one framework using deficit spending in time of recession is a stabilization idea. A um a uh, the Bancorp plan, an employer of last resort plan. Um, ABBA Learner's um, market anti-inflation plan. All of these things are automatic stabilizers, buffer stocks, if you will, the strategic petroleum reserve. And they're intended to uh, uh, stabilize an unstable system. And, and in from fact, a what, feedback perspective, yeah. the negative loop systems. And what, so what way Celeb is doing oh. is, is making them black, black as went more likely in finance, which the, I have much say because you I might mean he's a fucking idiot. <laughs> because why not, there we go. Da, da, by, da, by, da, not, da. by not understanding the yeah. dynamics of monetary policy, which Eric understands very well, and I, I do as well, courtesy of creating Minsky the software, um, it, what he's recommending and uh, reducing the level of government debt will cause the next financial crisis. So, Nassim, you're in there, but you're on the wrong fucking side. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna yeah. encourage him to download a copy of Minsky and model it and see what you know. I, I, actually, happens, right? I did I did I did give him the link, but uh, let's let's see. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a genuine intellect. He might be an asshole, yeah. but he's a genuine intellect, and yeah. so he may actually be curious to look at it and uh, and we'll have interest to see what he comes back on because as I t you saw, he would just bring his reply up to me up again. I have a bit of a look at. It. I want to, I want to be a bit of a dissection yeah. here. So, Ty, can you whack that up again? Okay, you po fucking idiot, you posted child's maximally simplified low dimensional accounting toy model that has no dynamics, wrong, because it's designed in Minsky, which is a system the next program, no foreign exchange, true, no cross border investment, true, no financial markets, true, no intertemporal froze, false, no supply and demand, sort of false, but I leave supply and demand out for good reason, and you're asking me to give you a proof. 
my basic proposition was that your fundamental proposition is wrong. And I don't need to bring in the other complications if your underlying premise is false. And as Eric can help us point out here, his underlying premise was the government borrows from the private sector, and that is false. And you don't need to bring any of the other, whatever else you throw at the system, if that's your starting point, you're wrong. Yeah, well, I think let's get them on and let's do a debate. Honestly, I mean, I, I remember when, well, no, seriously, but like, that's what people really, really want. You know, I saw I'd Robert, happy. I saw Robert Sapolsky get into it with um, Daniel Dennett on free will. And I know it's more my area of philosophy and stuff like that. But I mean, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed a very nuanced approach to determinism versus, you know, the, the other leading academic. These are, these are people that are like, paving new pathways and it's like mm. if you don't take the opportunity to showcase it and have an argument but i mean like argument in the sake of like a, a dialectic a, a yeah, let's yeah. really try and how do we get through this and i think that's that shared sort of approach yeah. um so i think if i could just jump in what i think happens with a lot of pundits mm -hmm. and even you know professionally trained economists is is kind of they offer policy before they understand the system yeah. And so the policy might not be appropriate for the particular system they're discussing, and they haven't modeled it and understood it first. And their mental models come from, let's say, textbooks, which sort of repeat the same narrative that, for all I know, may have been true when we had a gold standard 100 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's no longer true. And it's, you know, it's, it's uh, professors teach their students who teach their students who teach their students, and the storyline it just gets passed along, but nobody ever gets out from behind their desk and says, what is really going on here? I'm going to bother to find, I'm not going to, the real world economic analysis doesn't mean I go to a Federal Reserve website and download numbers and torture them with statistics. It's I go find out the structure of the system. I go to a bank yeah. and say, what do you do? I go to a central bank and say, let me spend a sabbatical and observe you and ask questions. What do you do? Let's look at when a you know a dollar is keystroked into existence. What happens mechanically, mm. the treasury, and so forth. And then if you did if economists did that, and then wrote their textbooks, <laughs> you'd have a very different you know fundamental starting point for policy. But they yeah. don't. They repeat yeah. the standard you know narrative from a textbook that they were taught you know X years ago. Uh, and the yeah, system you know evolves hold, over hold, time. So the hold on a second, Eric. Eric hold on a second. Too, over time. Hold so on a second, Eric. It's always uh, a, a game of catching. Eric, up Eric, hold, hold on a sec. We're gonna. I'm just gonna remind the audience to do. I want to let everybody know that we're on. We're on LinkedIn. We're on Twitter. Um, we want everybody and. We're on Twitter, we're on YouTube, we're on LinkedIn. So we're 1080p. We've got, you know, the show just keeps improving. So, you know, we really love and we want to thank the audience for all the support that they've been giving because the show has actually really increased over time. Um, the engagement is just very exciting. And we want to thank everybody for showing up on a, on, a, on a Saturday morning. I mean, that's at least on the Pacific coast where I'm from. We see people from all over the world. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, um, Eric, sorry to cut you off, but we got we to gotta do that every once in a while. Eric, what, what were you about to say? Yeah, so yeah, I was saying uh, you need to keep up with changes in the system itself. So regulatory changes is another way to create feedback, negative feedback loop. So um, an example was after the financial crisis, uh, we had the Dodd-Frank Act, a huge, massive regulatory laws. Uh, and there are some good things in there. One of them is, I think, Section 13, that uh, tells um, bankers that you need to check income before you provide a, a residential mortgage, which is a no-brainer. That's radical. We had to tell them that they need to check, actually. But um, actually, now... Uh, now they're trying to chip that away and remove Section 13. It's too bothering for a lot of uh, um, bankers. So they're lobbying to, to remove that section. We'll see how it goes. So that's interesting. Yeah. So they're like, you know, they can qualify based off of uh, equity and, uh, you know, financial yeah. assets and stuff like that. Yeah, the ninja loans at the end uh, yeah. during the financial crisis. Ninja, so uh, no income, no job, no assets. So we don't verify 
if you have any income, we don't verify if you have a job, or we don't verify if you have any collateral. You want to buy a $500,000 home, here we go. Here, here is the money. Yeah, so, you, you get, and you, uh, you're you get, in prison. We even give, we uh, it ended up being we gave mortgages to prisoners. <laughs> yeah, so. you get the, the, the idea <laughs> was to, to provide uh, the availability of housing to a greater portion of the population. That's good. Yeah. But then, how do you get there? <laughs> right. And mm -hmm. you know, the uh, uh, they didn't model or think through uh, the design of the. Um, system that led to the banking crisis, the, the, the housing crisis, right? And, and that's, that's what modeling uh, can reveal, you know, you, I have yeah. an idea. It's called the U.S. Infrastructure Bank. Both sides of the aisle agree that one of the, the forms, uh, one of the uh, proper function of government is to provide infrastructure, right? Roads and mm -hmm. dams and bridges and stuff. Mm -hmm. the, the conundrum is, well, how do I pay for it? Oh, a U.S. Yeah. Infrastructure Bank. It's, an, it's in somebody's head. What's, it, what's its design? Right that now, now here's where modeling before we go ahead and create it. Why don't we design a robust institution and have a, a scoring metric? Here's what we want it to accomplish. Right? I mean, we have the tools to do that, but nobody does that. They just write these damn bills. Half the Congress doesn't even read them, they're just told by leadership to pass them. And mm. then they and, and, and often there are good intentions. Yes, we want lots of people oh. to have houses. Mm. Of course. <laughs> yeah, but well, that the, gets passed yeah. and you get a disaster at some point. The most recent, like Dodd Frank, though, was really written by the financial industry itself. So they can yeah. basically include many loopholes in there and yeah, right. lay out yeah. the regulation. That's another way to go. Yeah, then, then there's yeah. other that's more uh, nefarious uh, motivation. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, this, and this is one reason why we should you know, have a better understanding how the financial system functions. Because it, 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 people think bankers, you know, they think in particular, they're masters of the universe. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're basically, I think they're more morons of the universe uh, <laughs> because there's a, a tendency that they, they put money into whatever gives a rapid return, like a three-month return, uh, and, and they all dive into the same bloody basket, and then the three-month return blows up and explodes. And that's how you get black swans quite frequently, by letting, by letting, letting bankers, pardon the French, fuck each other. And then bang, you get an explosion. So the classic for the, as Eric says, for the uh, for the global financial crisis was the uh, the whole uh, subprime loan fiasco. And what you had, you had you know bankers issuing loans, and those loans actually drive up house prices. That's the positive feedback loop. But I think we should use amplifying rather than positive and negative, because amplifying and dampening is a very obvious meaning compared to positive and negative. Yeah, People I think a positive say. loop is a good thing. It's actually a bad thing. So yeah, amplifying. Yeah. yeah, we'll say reinforcing and balancing because of yeah. that. Very so yeah. reinforcing, amplifying the loop. Uh, more more private debt means more money to buy houses, which drives up house prices, which encourages more household debt. And you get a runaway mm -hmm. loop like that. So that's that's what happens when you let the bankers make the decisions about where yeah. they invest. Yeah. 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 Really, it was wider yeah. than subprime. If you really look, uh, it, even in the prime sector, they started to issue those no doc or low doc mortgages. Oh. Okay, by uh, yeah, and, and so what you see then when you look at default uh, data is uh, you have a huge increase in default rate in among the uh, prime mortgages. Yeah, now it's not as dramatic as a subprime. So subprime uh, adjustable rate mortgage default rate went to like forty five percent of all of those mortgages were in default for. Uh, for prime, um, it went to about 5%, but you have to understand that the usual uh, average before that was like zero point something percent. So it's a huge mm. increase in default rate there because those practices really were were quite generalized. Okay. So so if, mm. um, if, if I may, for just a minute, when, when I teach system dynamics, uh, what I try and beat into people's heads is that we build big models from mm. little models. We take a little piece mm. of structure and we test the heck out of it. And we use test inputs, which are all sorts of external shocks that hit this little piece of structure. And then we watch what it does. And if it does something silly, we say, all right, we got to fix this. Because once you hook it up to another piece of structure and another piece of structure, and they're all interacting, 
eventually something's going to send something to that piece of structure that causes it to do something bizarre or go to yeah. infinity or divide by zero or, or, or mm. do something that can't be true. You know, food is being consumed, but there's no people in the model anymore. Stuff like that. So, so we, we do that just till the cows come home. We beat on these pieces of structure and then we put them together and beat on them some more until we have a robust structure that no matter how this thing is hit from the outside, it'll do the right thing. It won't do something bizarre. Okay. Now, from that generic discussion to more recently, Silicon Valley Bank, stress testing banks, we could build a model of a bank, either a particular bank or sort of a, a generic structure, one level of generality above. And say, let's hammer on this thing. And when does the, the thing go bankrupt or when does it cause problems? Right. And how, how then do we redesign it so it doesn't do that? Right. And that is not what we do in economics. Absolutely not. Yeah. This idea of silently quitting at the workplace is an interesting topic that I've been thinking about <clears throat> relatively recently. And I, and I can't stop thinking about uh, holistic solutions to the climate crisis. So I want to paint a picture that looks something like this. Um, <clears throat> rather than demonizing shareholders, you imagine building a model, Mike, where you had um, the you had the shareholders that were guaranteed by the, um, the 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 country. So the the U.S. government says we guarantee current level of profits and dividends for the next you know ten or fifteen years or something. Right? Very attractive. Very very attractive for shareholders. Um, but the, the program would rely, the program is part of a bigger program of shutting down the economy and going from a GDP of um, X to one tenth of X, right? Because it's the, this level of, of slowdown that's required to hit climate change and, you know, carbon, uh, carbon goals. Um, what, do you, what do you think about something like that? And, and then that's at the top end with the corporation buy-in. And then to use the example of the subprime lending, I'll just give you another example of actually like hit, giving money where, where, it's, where it's due. What happens instead of giving the money to the banks as bailout? What would have happened if we, um, if we would have given the actual people that had the mortgages, if we would have just paid off their houses and said, there you go. You made a stupid decision, but at least you're not homeless. There it is. And full, full, uh, jubilee like you actually don't owe nothing zero right so there's like massive support on both levels what what happens if we start looking at economies that way and dealing and and doling out cash and just absurd amounts of cash right and and, I, and i'm going to evoke uh, um the deficit myth and and bring monetary you know, the the modern monetary policy into here why can't we just do that why can't we just add zeros and and do what needs to be done to get the, the job done. Mike? Ah, uh, well, a lot, a lot to unpack there. <laughs> I, I, um, I might dive in first where you can unpack me because that was my original proposal, not quite that. That was like everywhere. Yeah. I talked about a modern debt jubilee and said that the way out of the financial crisis was first of all to acknowledge that too much private debt was created and the people who really drove that were the banks themselves even though individuals participated they were being conned by the banks to believe it was a good idea that's where the the the, uh, the big short the movie that makes a very nice job of you know how they were basically encouraging people in 120 uh, percent loan to equity uh, mortgages uh, no interest loans all this ninja all this garbage was created by the financial sector. And that's where the PhDs were. They were supposed to be experts. And, you know, the poor Ma and Pa Kettles who took that stuff seriously would so say, oh, it doesn't look right to me, but the banker says it's okay. He's got a PhD, so he must know what he's talking about. And so trust was exploited that way. So my argument was the way to, first of all, you had to control the banks, not let them do that sort of lending ever again. But the, the, the main uh, thing to do was to use the government's capacity to create money to pay off private debt. And then mm -hmm. that would then reduce the people, then pretty much the situation you're talking with. People would actually end up owning their own homes. You drastically reduce the level of private debt. Government debt would rise, but we here, unlike Nassim Taleb, know that's not a problem. Okay. And then, and then that would reduce the, um, 
discouragement that private debt gives to people to not spend, you get a higher velocity of money coming out of it as well. And when I modeled it, and I did model this in Minsky, it worked extremely well to revive an economy uh, by basically putting money in the hands of people who spend. So you, that is the sort of thing you should do. And the main thing I'm thinking about now is with climate crisis, there's no way the private financial sector is going to be profitable. Absolutely no way. Yeah. So if we, we get to the stage of a either a financial crisis caused by like the insurance sector deciding it can't insure anymore, uh, or a physical catastrophe like the Iowa wheat crop being wiped out or California ending on uh, the California Valley disappearing underwater in the next two or three weeks, which is actually not off the cards. Um, then in that situation, the only way you're going to have a financial system is viable is one that's government, the government, the, the vertical money that, you know, that Eric speaks about in his research where the government creates the money because the private sector is going to be cactus or pardon me, not cactus. In the California's type case, it'll be very wet avocado. Eric? Now, if you look at the, uh, I think a good way to, to see how we should have responded to the crisis is to go back to the way they responded in the 1930s. Um, yeah. We had a major reform of the mortgage industry, okay, where uh, the emergent, the creation of the 30 year fixed rate mortgages uh, was a, a government in, a innovation. Okay. They created okay. that to replace those. Uh, earlier mortgages that uh, basically were not fully amortizing. Uh, and um, so one thing we could have done, and that was done partially, but not fast enough and not permanently enough, was to indeed, at least for some people, put them in a more stable mortgage, move them away from interest-only pay option mortgages and put them on a 30-year a fixed rate mortgage. Okay, now that would not have worked for uh, quite a few people because quite a few people were put on a mortgage where they could, they should not have been there. They can't afford a house, at least not from a private uh, rural perspective. Now you can try to build more housing under government policies. Okay, we could do that. But if we stay with uh, how people went into uh, owning a home, a lot of them probably should not have uh, own a home in the first place okay they were just priced out they didn't have the income to sustain it okay and uh, so we do have, we could have done some restructuring major restructuring um and uh, for others that can't afford a house on their home you have to work on the public uh public side another thing that needed to be done was of course to um shut down banks uh, a lot of them were insolvent at the time. They should have been closed. And again, we did that to during the uh, 30s. We uh, declared a bank holiday for a week, and yet thousands of regulators that went to uh, into tens of thousands of banks checked their books and made three categories. The first category is you're good to go, you can reopen. The other one, you have a season easiest order where you have to restructure. And then if you do what we tell you to do in terms of restructuring, you can reopen. And the third one, we just shut you down, liquidate or sell you to a competitor. Okay. And uh, that didn't happen. Okay. Uh, the third thing is there was a huge amount of fraud recently. Yeah. And none of the CEOs or major players went to prison. Okay. Even yeah. though what it's about the PCORA? Well Pardon me. It, but the fraud was pervasive. What okay. about what about the PCORA Commission, though, Eric? Wasn't that uh, right. put a lot of yeah. that put so, a lot of them uh, behind bars, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, you, you, we had kind of our PCORA uh, uh, investigation with the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, but. Out of that came nothing, basically. They, well, that, they that's I, I misunderstood you because obviously during the night, they a lot of them did go to jail, and the Florida right. Commission yeah. was but behind now, it. This time, now, nothing. Did. The only no. person who went to jail was a person you couldn't not jail, which was Bernie Madoff. He was <laughs> such a blatant Ponzi scheme, and and he he screwed the big end of town. And that's the real crime. Okay, yeah, that's he put the, the problem, yeah. he sent the rich broke. It's okay, mm -hmm. sent the poor broke. That's fine. They're poor. Who cares? But he sent yeah. the rich broke, mate. We're going to put you in jail. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 the extent to which we didn't learn from the 1930s during the 2000s was just breathtaking because uh, like we, we could have put um, um, Bill, um, Bill Black 
in charge of it. Bill would have put him behind bars, you know. Um, mm. So we, we, and this is all the right people were in the wrong universities and the wrong centers, you and me, Bill mm. Black, the, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the people who, the critics are the ones who knew what to do. And we, weren't, we weren't listened to before the crisis. We weren't listened to after the crisis. So you had the mainstream who only believe, believe there are only white swans to throw Taleb back in here again. They're the ones who made the decisions. And what we ended up with is, is a, a, a mess on the other side where we're still carrying about 90% of the level of private debt we had back at the financial crisis. Mm. But, um, you know, I know we're going to talk about secular stagnation, which is one of your new research areas, if I believe, understand correctly, Eric. And it's, it's yeah, not it's secular so. stagnation, it's debt stagnation after mm -hmm. a debt crisis where we, we haven't cleared the decks, which they did clear rather painfully in the 1930s and 40s. Why do you call it secular stagnation, Eric? Oh, that's a term that uh, is pretty old now. Uh, um, and uh, the idea is that we uh, have a, an economic system that is... Uh, basically reaching a state of stagnation okay and um, so how do you um, you have an economy that is a, a growing in an anemic way um, you have basically uh, an economy in which the uh, fruits of growth are not distributed um, uh, widely throughout the population and so that plus other things means that you have uh, an economic growth that uh, tend to um, be more anemic than it could be. Yeah, I think In the fact, term started uh, with uh, Alvin Hansen, uh, chair of Harvard's okay. economics department, mm -hmm. the American Keynes, uh, where he worried that after World War II, all the GIs would come back and flood the labor market and stag and they wouldn't have jobs and would stagnate. And more recently, Larry Summers has re yeah. revised the idea. I was waiting for Larry to Larry, you, you didn't take credit for the idea, mate. Come on, pop it up there. Say it was your yeah. word. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think that, that was a classic. This is talking about Twitter once more. I was watching the conversation between the, the mainstream, you know, one envelope talking to another envelope. Um, I, mean, I know you did, Larry, but you need to acknowledge it now, mate. You're not, you're not keeping your side up here. So come on, take credit. <laughs> um, so you, you had Larry Summers giving a talk with, with um, Paul Krugman in the audience and Paul saying how brilliant Larry was being right now. He's talking about secular stagnation, what actually caused the financial crisis. Oh, I was going, oh, for Christ's sake, you guys are off with the bloody fairies. What caused it was a de private debt bubble bursting, which is exactly what caused it back in the 1930s. You morons don't learn from history because you don't read the statistics that are outside your envelope. And this is another classic case of them doing that. So secular stagnation has come back as an explanation. And partly they're saying, look, we've had all the good ideas, there's really no new technologies are going to come along. Oh, gee, look at that lovely SpaceX rocket taking up up there and landing back on its ass and reducing the cost of rocketing by 95%. Uh, that can't happen because we have secular stagnation. So mm -hmm. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for Elon Musk to put a chip in my head. But uh, while I'm waiting for that, just a couple of What about of your shoulder? Oh, that's Nassim <laughs> Taleb. Pardon me. <laughs> just a couple of comments uh, to answer Dan's original question. Um, yeah, I, I think um, in terms of, you know, modern monetary theory, um, releasing the uh, the sound finance, uh, I got to balance a budget at my house, the government should do it as well, idea yeah. does free up a lot of resources and, and it frees our minds as to what's possible. Uh, in terms of Steve's debt jubilee, I think that, um, you know, modeling needs to be done there. And I think a one-off that's not anticipated might very well work, but I'd, I'd want to either model it or see it. Maybe Steve's model it. I'm not sure. But, I have modeled um, it, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. But what I, what I would worry about is um, having a debt jubilee routinely, because now we get into moral hazard. It's like too big to fail banks. Hey, I can let her rip because they're not going to uh, sh shut me down like they did in the 30s, as Eric was describing. They're going to bail me out and I'm probably not going to jail either. So I'm going to make these shady mortgages or do whatever goofiness. Uh, you, you had to, you know, you had to control the, the banks. It frightens me a, a, a little bit. You, you had bit. to control the banks. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, my, finally, my, my idea. Yeah. So go ahead, Sorry. Steve. I don't want to interrupt. Sorry. Okay. Yes, you do. Uh, um, <laughs> 
Um, what I proposed as well was what I called, uh, um, I have a, a Jubilee shares. Everything thinks I suck here. Well, you suck somewhere. We know that. Okay. Uh, come on, back on, back on. Back on. Uh, where was I? Uh, yeah, so I, I wanted to have, have um, mortgages limited to no more than 10 times the rental income of the property which is being purchased. So if you get, when, when, when banks say they base the lend, the size of the loan on the income of the borrower, that was bullshit. But back in when my father was a banker and quite active, um, the, the maximum uh, you could borrow was three times your annual income. And you had to have a 30% deposit. That was the, the mentality in the 1950s, which was a reaction to the 40s, the 30s and 40s, you know, the, the, the Great Depression. Now they go to the stage where they say, based on your income 10 times, blah, 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 forget it. And so the, the, my solution was to say, you could lend no more than 10 times the actual or imputed rental income of the property you were buying. And that then would make a link between rental income and mortgages, which would be less destabilizing than one where income was, you know, it was a joke measure and you had a, a, a amplifying feedback between the level of debt and house prices. So that was one particular control there. And also we, we have to like look at what banks actually do. Uh, they create money. And when you know they create money, well, we want to create money for worthwhile endeavors in capitalism, not Ponzi schemes. So we then say, if you want to, if you're going to create money, you can do it for large consumption items that individuals can't buy themselves, and you don't get an asset bubble out of that. Um, and working capital for corporations, you need them to have working capital. Now, instead, they issue, you know, short-term corporate bonds instead. And entrepreneurs, giving money to entrepreneurs, that's what they should be limited to, and no more than that. Yeah, and, and and Dan, your final or your first part of your question about the government guaranteeing profits, I think you were mentioning as sort of a system redesign. You know, in some sense, they do that at least here and there. They'll sell, they'll tell the pharmaceutical companies make the COVID vaccine, and we'll buy them all from you. So, yeah. at this price, or they go to a um, a military industrial complex contractor and say we'll buy so many missiles and bombs, and we, you know. And in some sense, can lock in a contract guaranteeing the, the profits and, and what have you. So the governments do do that sort of thing to some degree. But I think you were sort of speculating about um, a more general, uh, rather than somebody picking and choosing this industry or that crisis or whatever that. And then now we're, we're evolving to a, mm -hmm. a, a more socialist sort of um, way of running the system. Um I don't know. Again, cries out for modeling to what, you know, devil's in the details, right? Derek, what you just tell me, what the work you're doing on secular stagnation, can you explain that to us a bit? Yeah, so uh, that was part, uh, that was a, more of a side gig than uh, something okay. that I really went into. Um, that was for a handbook on secular stagnation. Actually, no, that came before that. That was for a uh, first uh, a, a private uh, consulting financial firm that wanted to my opinion on the interest rates okay. and so uh, what you have observed since the 19 uh, late, yeah, early 1980s mid 80s is that interest rates have been falling okay uh, that's a general trend now of course they've been rising back up recently okay but uh, until 2022, okay, the trend is a downward, continu almost continuous downward trend. And so um, try to explain that. And uh, so the explanation I, I brought forward is the idea, well, you have economic growth that is slowing. And so the economy, uh, economy's ability to sustain a uh, higher interest rate is basically uh, also going down. And so you have to bring down interest rate with the slowing of economic growth. Otherwise you get uh, instability and crisis. Okay. And so the, the major point I was trying to, to bring out is that uh, uh, unless you have a change in economic dynamics, interest rates are, are going to have to stay low. Otherwise they're going to create financial instability. And so yeah, we yeah. went. In, I went into trying to explain what caused um, uh, secular stagnation. Okay, so uh, going into issues of income inequality, wealth inequality, 
is uh, one aspect. Disengagement of the government into the economy is another one. And so that's basically the, the work. Yeah. So I, I would actually um, make an elaboration on that because um, one major reason for secular stagnation is what we're approaching now, which is the energy crunch, because uh, the energy return and energy invested has been declining over mm -hmm. it, right back in the 1850s, but it's been declining quite severely uh, in the last 20 years. And it could actually, it actually could turn to the stage where the energy return is less than one. And if we mm -hmm. hit that, then that's good, good night capitalism. Uh, mm -hmm. So the only way to get around that, apart, apart from leaving aside the fact we're destroying the ecosphere by doing it, would be to bring out a new energy source where you get a far higher energy return and energy invested. And partially people see that in solar, which is very questionable uh, mm -hmm. technology, te technically, uh, yeah. but obviously uh, you know, small scale modular nuclear reactors would give a much higher return. Right. If we ever get fusion worked out, that would be a gigantic return. Uh, but if we if that, that I think if there's anything secular about stagnation, it's the decline in energy return and energy invested. Nicely organized. Yeah. Um, Eric, <clears throat> I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, earlier <laughs> on, you saw ah. Mike's I'm going to say list. failed attempt. My vote, Mike, is that you nailed it, even if you forgot those other guys. And the ones in the middle, Eric. Make sure you don't forget the middle. Don't forget the middle, Eric. And here's the thing. Um, you know, don't pretend that you're in front of a lecture hall of a thousand new students or anything like that. It's just friends. You just got to jump into it. And the words, the names are going to kind of throw you a little bit. But the best people that do this and get the applause at the end, the ones that have a nice fast cadence, okay, and people that just commit to the name. Confidence, okay? so baby. Confidence. Confidence. you got to have confidence. Eric, I'm going to get you to read the top chatters lists right now. Go ahead and start with John in the top left-hand corner. Go ahead, Eric. Okay, John Throton, Bruce Consindini, Marilyn Haywood Page, Teresa Sanders, Frankfurt Z, Richard X O'Brien, Nick Ballesteros, Muhammad Furkan Maksud, Around the wick Wicked, uh, Gunny 1972, The Hasty Ant, Steve Fit, Danger Zone, Christopher Dobby, Big Hammer, Guy Focus, Larry Summers, Wayne McMillan, David Wilkie, Channel Math, Mandy Morho, Tony Wilson, not Tony Wilson, Syndicate, Steve Fritz, uh, Hello Internets, Bert, Bert Lawrence, Dave Crossland, Jim Roberts, Folk for America, Positive Economy Reform Ideas, The Atheist Paladin, uh, Tony Wilson, Matthias Seddon, Economics in One Lesson, Douglas Duwell, J.D., uh, Drug E., Jens Rodberg, Petrify Produce, Lana Dell Hates the Clock, She Watches, N.G., Pat Brannigan, Potato Sack, Philip Bynes, Botched Mandala, Apple Sack, Tonya Richard, Goss on the sh Half Shelf, TR, Sophia Eris, Boas, Algorithm, politic e Political Economy 101, the Bruce Creative Global Funding Services. Mm. And Rick O'Brien. Rick, uh, Rick O'Brien. Harry Heyman, Philadelphia. Igor is in Sanic, Joe Polito, MVDG. Oh, those ones too. All oh, right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Stay in stiletto. I'm, I'm there for you, bud. I'm your friend. I'm your friend. Uh, Damien Geppetto, Sean Damrotowski, and Astrid Fjord. Fjord. All right. Hmm. Yeah. You know, it's almost, it's almost as disappointing. I will take that down there, Julie. Um, it's almost as disappointing to hear Steve's. Uh. <laughs> I, I actually, I, I must love admit, you, Steve. This, this is an interesting form of, of, of showing perception because I also missed the middle column until halfway through what Eric was saying. Oh, shit, there's a third column there. Because once yeah. your eyes are trained a particular pattern, and Mike, you can tell us the system dynamics involved here, I'm mm -hmm. sure, uh, you don't see a new element, which is the third down the middle. 
Yeah, so, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I it was it sort of totally didn't see it when I read it. Yeah. yeah. And, and remember so, last last week it was like we did it and we we did it like bottom right or some sort of new thing point. and then the guest did it the same way we're like wow that's and never had we done that before right so mm -hmm. yeah. It's well what patterns are we locked into without knowing that we're locked into them that that's that that's is, there's there's lots of there's actually a yeah. lot of research going on even at my university on tracking eye movement on computer screens and where people are looking at stuff and I'm not sure exactly what it's all it's in the learning sciences but it it matters where you're where you're looking yeah yeah you're, absolutely you're, inter, when you're acting interacting with the computer yeah. so eric i have a i kind of have a, a speculative question i throw these out and sometimes they're hard to wrestle with but i would like to put the idea that you have a nation and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the united states because they're kind of the biggest i think they're the biggest they've got the biggest bat to swing but let's say there's another country that has um, an ability to print their own currency, and they're very, very bullish on a, on a on a modern monetary approach. So much so that they just keep flooding and flooding and flooding their nation. We could say Canada, it doesn't, or Australia, it doesn't really matter at this point. But they keep flooding their country with money. I my curious, my question is. What does the international community do about rising debt levels inside of a country? Because although they may have the policy of uh, the understanding of modern monetary policy and a little less restrictions on, you know, how, how to use money, the international community may not have that same uh, understanding, if you will. How does the international community view countries that have ballooning debt if that was the case like that's what i'm curious about eric yeah. so i think the the premise of the question is not put correctly uh the idea that mmt is about flooding the economy with money is really not what we're all about mm. here um we're going back to something i think you you brought forward before which is what prevent us to create money to do other things like uh, besides the military and how. so it's a question of what is your public purpose okay what do you want the government do to uh, for you as a society um, and once you have decided that you have to check if you have the existing economic resources to implement the public purpose so the, the way uh, MMT goes about is not about let's flood the economy with money. It's about rethinking the policy making practices of government away from trying to focus on balancing the budget, okay, uh, toward uh, a view of tax and spending that is geared toward meeting the public purpose. So let's take an example. Let's say you want to fight climate change. Okay, and we're gonna take two examples, one with spending and one with taxes. And uh, we're gonna go extreme, okay. Um, let's say you want to really eliminate CO2 emission, okay, uh, just to make it simple. And uh, let's say that you decide to you just say that we're gonna do it through government spending, investment in uh, um, uh, uh, like nuclear energy or things like that and you figure out that to be able to do achieve the goal you need to um, spend every year about five percent of your gdp okay to do that okay um that is you need to use five percent of your national resources to be able to transition toward an economy that is free of carbon emission well, the, the, the question becomes first, well, do we have the necessary skills, labor, and, and technology available to us to do this transition? Okay. And so the spending is not look in terms of how many trillions of dollars it's going to cost, okay, but rather what proportion of resources does it require and do we have that available to us? If we don't, can we find a way to free that to be able to meet the needs, the resource needs? Okay, so that's from the point of view of spending. Uh, the point of view of taxing, uh, 
the taxes that will be uh, put in place will be the one that eliminates CO2 emission. So what you want to do is put in place taxes on CO2 emission as high as necessary to eliminate uh, CO2 emission. That's the premise we have here. And if the, the tax policy is successful, tax revenue will be zero because there won't be any emission. So you don't look at the tax uh, policy in terms of how much revenue does it raise, but you look at it in terms of does it achieve the goal for which it was put in place, which in this case was eliminate CO2 emission. Now you can generalize this to, for example, um, decreasing wealth inequality. Okay, uh, Senator Warren uh, proposed to have a 2% tax on wealth uh, to try to, uh, within that context. And the way she justified it, and she said, oh, well, let's see if we put a 2% tax on wealth, we'll be able to feed the hungry kids here down uh, you know, on, I, on the other side. So we have raised enough money. But if you look at it from the point of view of the goal, which is to reduce wealth inequality, what you really need here are tax rates that are way higher than that to achieve that goal. Okay, probably uh, Randy say you need to tax 100%, even more than 100% if you really wanted to really uh, achieve the goal because a lot of the wealth is offshore, okay, and it's un, uh, hidden. So you, you look at tax rate uh, and tax policy not as a mean to raise revenue, but achieve the goals you set for yourself, which are reduce the bads, whatever you define the bads. So it could be pollution, could be uh, wealth inequality. That's a political decision. Another reason why you would raise taxes is to try to free resources to um, meet the needs of uh, government spending. So the uh, ex uh, the uh, Practical example is Keynes, how to finance the war, okay? We have Britain in uh, the uh, Great Britain in, uh, in, in the 1940s that need to um, move a lot of resources to the war efforts. So the uh, proportion of government spending uh, in the GDP needs to move, say, from 20% uh, to 50%, okay? And you want to try to uh, do that without generating inflation. Well, uh, you're going to have to find a way to compel the uh, private sector to cut its spending because we're already at full employment. The idea at the, at the time was we're already at full employment. We can't grow the economy anymore. So the only way to increase the amount of resources going to the government is to cut the share of private spending. And so you do that through tax policies, to deferred income policies, and then you also have others like uh, promote saving bonds and uh, things like that. So, uh, yeah, MMT is not about just flooding the economy. It's just about rethinking taxing and spending in a way that is consistent with the goal of that you have in mind in terms of what the public purpose is. And within that context, um, balancing the budget is not is not a goal. Okay, it's not only yeah. unachievable but it's also uh, problematic on itself for the economy. So Dan, uh, yeah, that, was, that was great, Eric. Uh, Dan, the way I would sort of call people's attention is to the, um, the notion that, you know, if other countries have, or the leaders of other countries have different mental models or they follow different narratives, uh, the more traditional sound finance narrative, uh, and how would they react to your example of a nation who that was really into modern monetary theory and, and, and so forth? And um, I call everybody's attention to the famous uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff paper about 2010, where they showed that, you know, if a country's debt to GDP ratio uh, hit whatever, 50 percent, their GDP 90. would decline. Well, then at 90, 90, it was yeah. cut in half, right? And that triggered austerity all, all over Europe. That triggered the Republican Party's uh, prosperity proposal and what have you, because they were following a particular mental model. Now, the, 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 the sequel to the story is there were some students at UMass Amherst, a heterodox economics department. I think they were in an econometrics class, graduate econometrics class. And as an assignment, they had to reproduce uh, a famous paper. So some students picked that one. And they couldn't Thomas read Hendren. the results. 
And then they contacted Reinhardt and Rogoff and said, you know, we can't. And their paper turned out to be wrong. The students had uncovered errors and the results <laughs> fell apart. But look at all the damage potentially that was done worldwide hmm. based on a narrative and then a, a paper by smart people who supported, you know, a confirmation bias supported the, 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 this narrative. Yeah, and so you know, there are talk, talk. policies uh, like, uh, for example, in the UK after the, the Great Depression, they put in place those, uh, the Great Recession, I mean, they put in place those austerity policies and deficits went up, <laughs> basically. So because when yeah. you do create austerity, you re reduce tax revenues, okay? Uh, and more generally, again, if you look at the papers uh, on the MMT side we have brought uh, to the table to try to enter the public discourse in terms of the Green New Deal, for example, okay, uh, there is a very nice paper by Yeva, Narcissian, and Randy that tried to analyze the uh, Green New Deal, not from the point of view of the financial and how many trillions it's going to cost. And so there are many estimates. Some say it's $90 trillion, others it's uh, $5 trillion. So it's all over the place, okay? But more in, uh, in terms of do we have... Or, so the Green New Deal, if you remember, it's a policy, a 10-year policy, to try to transition the economy away from, uh, or not transition away, but at least put it in a more stable, start the transition. Um, and it's a 10 year policy. And what they analyze is that we need about a gross term, we need about 5% of GDP. Net term, it's about 1% of GDP per year over 10 years to be able to do this. And so when you look at it in, in terms of amount of resources you need, rather than how many trillions of billions it's gonna cost, uh, you, you have a more rational discussion. It's a far less scary discussion too. And it shows you that some of these things are, are actually doable, okay? It's not a matter of finding the money that it's not a problem, it's of find, finding the resources. And it looks like resources are there. We could do it if we put the political will behind it. Same thing with social security. Okay, this idea that social security is going to go bankrupt, it's going to run out of money. We need to reform social security. It's all framed in financial terms. And again, there are very nice paper, Randy, back when uh, 10, 10, 20 years ago, that look at it in terms of, no, in terms of demographic, in terms of productivity, in terms of uh, changing the skills of the population. And again, if you look at the transition toward uh, an elderly population, uh, really it's again, it's doable, okay? The trends, productivity trends are there, are such that it's actually doable. We will be able to meet the demands, but we need to be aware of the skills we need in the future and prepare for that by training people yeah, yeah. in the proper things, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like this, this is back to the your question, Dan, uh, modern monetary theory is reality. That's how the governments create money. And, and, and my credit analysis fits in quite coherently yeah. with that. Uh, but if you look at what governments have been doing, they've been using modern monetary theory without knowing they are, uh, but to finance asset bubbles. So like in my own mm. home country in particular gave people money. Uh, when the financial crisis hit back in 2008, doubled and trebled the grant they gave to first home buyers to buy a house to keep the bubble going. And yeah. that was literally using the capacity of the state to create money to keep an asset bubble going. America uses MMT to finance foreign wars that it shouldn't be in in the first bloody yeah. place. Okay, so we, we're having all these elements where people are doing it. If you want to see one of the classic instances of this, uh, this is how Germany reindustrialized after the uh, when, yeah. the, when the when the mm -hmm. Nazis got in charge, and the the war machine that the Nazis built was fundamentally financed by uh, government money creation, and is one of the most remarkable things I've learned by some snide uh, Nazi prick writing to me on on Twitter at one point saying, "Why don't you acknowledge your forebears, Keane? Why don't you acknowledge Henry Ford as the source of your ideas?" And I went looking at well as being an outrageous anti-Semite. Uh, Henry Ford also understood endogenous money. And the one person that Hitler thanked in the dedication for Mein Kampf was Henry Ford. So, yeah. I'm going to stay so, away from, I'm yeah. away from Ford, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Henry Ford, I, I used, uh, so Ford, Ford was Ford and, 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 and Edison were both aware of government money creation. 
And so this once you harness it, you can do something very good with it. But unfortunately, governments that aren't actually aware of it are using it to do very, very bad things. Yeah, you have to yeah. distinguish two things, the financial praxis of governments and their pol policy praxis. The financial praxis is really following MMT. Why? Because MMT there is just describing what's happening, mm. this interaction between Treasury and and central bank and how they coordinate to make sure that the finances of the government in general go smoothly. So the financial practice, they do MMT if you want. The policy making practices do not follow MMT prescriptions at all. Okay. Because they do not, they are focused on financial narrative and financial constructions of debates and moving away from, um, what we really need to focus on, which is resources and political constraints. Those are the two main ones. So, fill out so political, Dan, yeah, fill out political constraints a little bit more because I mean, I understand financial resources, uh, um, but I mean, f the, the, the political constraints, because where I'm sitting, I see a predominantly leftist, progressive view uh, that is adopting the, the MMT, just like climate change. And so the reason why I kind of press on you guys is because I, I always try and take a conciliant approach of how to actually speak the language of the other side because mm -hmm. we're in political deadlock. Yeah, no, it's important. Yeah, to, um, that's to important. I mean, frame all, yeah, it's important to frame it from a viewpoint of the other side so they can. Yeah, I think that's yeah. right. So no, the the if you look at the um, the public opinion in the United States, actually. Um, a lot of the job guarantee is very popular. Uh, a lot of them, uh, a lot of public opinion is for a uh, transition toward uh, a greener economy. And if you look at the, the U.S. public opinion overall, it's actually quite progressive. It's not represented by any of the parties, either neither Democrat or Republican. They are to the left of both parties. The in the United States, and here we're moving away from MMT and more going into politics, pure politics, uh, the uh, agenda, what's put on the agenda and what determines political debate is driven purely uh, or mostly by money. Okay, there is a very yeah. good book by uh, go The Golden Rule by, um, what's his he name? He who has the gold makes the rules. That's and right. uh, yeah. and like the, we do have a one a one uh, entity one vote and the yeah. the entity is called the dollar, uh, yeah. which so, is why uh, democracy Thomas doesn't Ferguson, break. It's it's, it's, it's financial power. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Thomas Ferguson, the Golden Rule, has a very good book that traced the role of money in okay. politics in the United States, and um, yeah, it's basically uh, po what is put on the ballot. Uh, what is the political agenda, which is actually probably more important than just one person, one vote, at least as important. What are the discussions we're going to debate and vote on? Uh, these are important things. Those are entirely driven by the uh, money, uh, the moneyed uh, class. Okay. And so you don't put in power or you don't put close to power uh, people that are uh, more of the workers. So if you look at the representation of workers in uh, politics in the United States, it's extremely low. Okay. Most people don't come from a worker's background. Okay. We have made a lot of progress in terms of representation of women, but in terms of representations of um, just um, standard people, if you want to put it that way. Okay. Or if you want to take more Marxist bent of the workers, uh it's extremely low okay and yeah um, and that's yeah. understandable politics is an expensive uh is an expensive activity to be involved in okay uh to run uh to run a campaigns um is extremely expensive and so you you look at um finding source of funds um now you have exception to that if you look at bernie sanders or uh uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, most of their, they had run successful campaign on small donations. Okay. Mm -hmm. They refused corporate money. Okay. But that's the exception. 
And I think this is one of the dangers. That, like that, that book, by the way, Tom Ferguson, he's another bloke we should have on here. He's a damn good friend of mine. And mm -hmm. Tom has done some extremely good work on quantifying politics. So that I've actually put the link in the, the book in the, in the list there. So, yeah, so Tom's, Tom's work is fabulous on that front. And it, it, it comes down to it. We have, we have the best politicians money can buy. And that's the whole problem. <laughs> Uh, you need to get to the point where you can't buy them with money, which we'll never do. It's going to be stuck with us until capitalism falls apart. But if you look back and see where uh, the idea of democracy came from, and I spoke with Yanis Varoufakis about this a couple of weeks ago on my uh, Debunking Economics podcast, the original Athenian democracy was a sortition. You did not vote for individuals. What happened was, I think there were 13 major families in Athens. The 13 major families were asked to nominate five or so individuals each. Then the five or so individuals were asked to nominate other people and went about 10 different cycles until finally the people at the end of that system were the ones who became the uh, the demos, the people who made the decisions. So it was a sortition process. And that meant even though you started off by asking the most powerful families, it was so diluted and diffused and transferred through other groups that you basically had a representative system making your decisions. And we need something like that. And we need also to have experts and system dynamics in there. We won't get it. We're going to go down in a pile of shit uh, with, with, with money at the top dragging us all down, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, yeah. Where, where, did, where, did you, where to jump in? I, yeah, I, I mean, I heard something about the Athenian democracy where it was like uh, one pebble, one vote. And at its zenith, there was... Uh, the the poll list was ten thousand strong, um, and I know that you 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 had somebody that would basically sit in office once a, like one time in their life, or it would keep rotating. But you'd be able to sit in there for one day. Um, what, yeah, not quite that. Yeah, actually, I'd, I'd like to bring us. Sorry, pardon me, mate. I'd like to bring us some of the stuff people have been discussing on the side there, because yeah, I was yeah. going to be asked. Uh, what would we use the state's money creation power for in the crisis we're about to walk into, which is the climate crisis? Uh, that would be, uh, first of all, using, as, as Eric said earlier, using tax and other policies to reduce consumption, which is what was done during the Second World War. War bonds were not sold to finance the war. It's actually explicitly realised, the only really is this well, this is quite recently, people who were selling the war bonds knew they were being used not to finance the war, but to produce private consumption and reserve yeah. more of the industrial capacity for producing Liberty ships. And if I was going to go for anything like that in the climate crisis, we have to, if we did try to use money, government money creation capability, as Eric was also saying in his example, to uh, address the climate crisis by reducing our need for fossil fuel energy, we have to replace 85% of our current energy mix because 85% comes from fossil fuels. The only way that it'd be feasible to do that very rapidly would be, would be bring about a, a stable uh, form of nuclear power and, and that's, I, I put a link of uh, into Copenhagen Atomic, which is a, co a private company trying to bring about thorium uh, based, that they could also be uranium, that did not necessarily be thorium alone, molten salt nuclear reactors, which fit inside a container, like literally a shipping container, 40 foot long, 10 by 10 feet, I think they are, and provides 40 megawatts of power. Now, that would be the climate change equivalent of Liberty ships. And what I would have the government just say, we're going to throw all the money we can, about all the engineers we can, throughout the Manhattan Project of the global, of, of the, of the, of the ecolo ecological crisis, would have to be producing small modular nuclear reactors as fast as possible to replace our reliance upon fossil fuels and yeah. ship them as rapidly as we can, integrate them into local domestic small scale networks if we can, uh, to make it possible to have a, dis a distributed energy system uh, and, and rapidly get us down to zero carbon. I think we need zero carbon by 2030, fuck 2050. Uh, so in that case, that's where we'd be using MMT's capability and knowledge of the government's money creation powers. Uh, to do it. But it's not going to happen, Eric, because you and I are on the outside. We're not on the inside. Yeah. The, the International Energy Agency has actually put forward a plan 
that they think is realistic to achieve. They are at 2050, which I think also is, well, we do the best we can, I guess. But given the technology that are we have now and future technologies, they have put forward a plan uh, to um, achieve zero, zero net emission by 2050. And it's a genius plan. You have to keep at it, but it's doable. The first item on the agenda was published to, uh, to 2020. The first item on, on the agenda was no new uh, uh, oil field exploitation. You have to stop uh, expansion of oil field right now. And then mm -hmm. they have a plan yeah. that shows you what to do over time. And yeah, you have to, yeah, you have to have the will. A, it's, uh, you have to have a war mentality for it, basically. Yeah, it's definitely. A, a sense of urgency, yeah. except that it's not over like a few years, it's over decades and you have to keep at it, okay? Um, the, I think one of the problem with, um, mm -hmm. Uh, well, where we have to be careful uh, with, with this is, is give false promise to people. A lot of people think that if we do all of this, the climate is not going to get worse. It will get worse regardless oh, yeah. of what we do. That's Temperatures are going to rise whatever we do. The problem is no longer avoiding the rise is to contain the rise in temperature. Yeah. And um, so... Some of the complaints that are going to come is that people are going to say, hey, we're doing all this, but things are not going to get better, are not going getting better. Things are getting worse, getting hotter. It will. No matter what we yeah. do, it's going to get worse. Okay. Well, we're not no longer in that gameplay here. We're in, in containment measures now. That's because yeah. systems have momentum and yeah. they're consisting of stocks yeah. and flows. So when the, the uh, commander of an aircraft carrier says hard a port and the helmsman cranks the wheel or today a joystick or whatever they do to the left left hand side the aircraft carrier just doesn't turn on a dime it keeps going yeah. in the same direction for a mile before it begins to yeah so the policy was implemented when the commander said hard to port and the system went a mile yeah. before the temperature kept rising before it started to gradually yeah. and that's just the nature of complex systems Mm -hmm. So yeah. if I may, Dan, I just wanted to respond to a comment that was made here a while ago. I, I actually took a screenshot here because we got comments flying by on the screen and it's hard to keep track. But Ghost on the Half Shell says recessions and depressions every year or so. The long depression of the 1920s lasted five and a half years, but no one remembers it after 1929. So I thought I'd tell you everybody a little story. It's kind of interesting, a macro story. So in the 1970s, hey, my hey, Mike, 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 Mr. Mike Radzicki, this is the uh, producer here. I want you to continue telling this story, but I just want to help Dan out and uh, remind everybody to hit the like button on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, <laughs> now known yeah, as one of these. Make sure you hit that notification bell. Mike, you look like the hippie version of the Unabomber. I love it. Please carry on with your train of thought. Thank you. That was a gentle scolding. But that, that was a that was a gentle scolding, by the way, from from producer Ty Keens, right? So yeah. <laughs> I, I get too absorbed in the conversation, and I have to thank everybody for like. I mean, we wouldn't be here without everybody putting in the chats and and the comments and stuff. So keep the engagement up. Like, follow. Um, go over to the subscribe, Steve's Patreon page. Subscribe. Go, go to Steve's Patreon page and, and yep, donate. Yeah, Patreon, yeah. Yeah, and multiples of $100 a week. That's, you know, he's good with that. I, <laughs> you like I, can, I can make a plug before my story. Uh, I, yep. On my Trending Cycles YouTube channel, I did put up a, a course on, a first course in system oh, yeah. dynamics. Yeah. And uh, so it's for free. It doesn't have any of the materials or whatever on YouTube, but you can see how I go about introducing somebody to system dynamics if you're so inclined. So it's it's uh, trending cycles uh, YouTube uh, channel, but you know, yep. shameless plug. <laughs> no, it's a good um, one. It's allowed here for sure. So at any rate, um, so Forrester in the 1970s uh, was being scolded by the economics profession for his his. Um, World Dynamics and the follow-up study, The Limits to Growth, and the economists were saying, you don't know what you're doing and what have you. And so Forster said, well, you know what? Um, we're in uh, this um, stagflation thing, and you guys don't know 
what to do about it, so don't pick on me. So he decided to build a macro model of the U.S. economy, and it was it became quite large, and it would it generated the sorts of behaviors you'd expect. It generated exponential growth, generated a business cycle. There was some noise in it, and all these modes of behavior interacted, and you could turn them on and off when you wanted to look at this or that. But the model also generated this 50 to 60 year cycle that was intertwined with everything else. And Forrester said, gee, we made a mistake here. And he said, if I'm going to publish this thing, the economists are going after me. I better make sure that this thing is bulletproof. So I'll stop. Let's tear the model apart. Thousands of equations. Let's find the mistake. And it took them months to do that. And guess what? No mistake. Everything exactly. was the way he wanted. He was modeling what he saw. Then and only then did he send students scurrying to the Dewey Library with the task, find, Forster's engineer, find out if there's any evidence of an economic long wave in the literature. And sure enough, a Russian economist, Nikolai Kondratiev, in the 1930s had written about this economic long wave he had found in the data for a, a number of European nations. Now, Kondratiev was highly regarded by Stalin and the, the government of of the Soviet Union at that time. And um, <clears throat> he uh, started investigating Russian data. And he said, well, there seems to be the same <laughs> pattern here. Stalin didn't like that because, of course, Stalin was applauding when it looked like capitalist countries had this mm -hmm. you know, thing yeah. going on. But dear mother Russia, no, no. So uh, Kondratiev was sent to the gulag, tried, uh, found oh. guilty, and executed. And all of his papers were removed from the annals of Russian science. Uh, also, since he wrote in Russian, a lot of people didn't, in, at least in the United States, didn't, didn't know about it. So Forrester said, well, we might have something here. The model is telling us something we didn't know. And, and Kondratiev, another reason that his stuff didn't catch on, it's argued, is he had no explanation for why it was happening. Just that he was observing this in the data. And Forrester had, the model explained uh, why it was happening. So uh, <laughs> Jay got beaten up a lot about, uh, oh, you're just making a model to do something weird, to get attention to yourself or something. So one of John's, uh, Jay's students, John Sturman, went out to IAZA, the International in Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Vienna one summer. He was a student, he had the summer off. But you have to go, you have to have a project when you're there. And so he built a little mini model of Jay's model and turned it into a game. And he had people play the game. It was, you could run this little teeny economy. You had complete 100% information. There was no preordained behavior to the, to the model in the game. And all you had to do was decide how much plant and equipment you wanted to produce each simulated period. And you had to produce it for yourself because you were the capital producing sector because you need machines to make machines. And then you had to produce it for your client, which was the goods producing sector. And guess what? Almost everyone who played the game generated economic long ways, Kondraty of cycles, even though it wasn't preordained, including economists he had play who said Kondraty of cycles didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> and and to, to, to go on Hashell's comments, uh, a lot of people said, yeah, but the time frame is so long. A manager that would experience one cycle, that's it. Their career's over. They're not going to remember that it's a cyclical thing. And of course, economists either try and explain historically, why did the Great Depression happen? There's different explanations, but everybody thinks it's a one-off unusual mm. occurrence rather than a repetitive uh, nature of a, a capitalist system. Again, we got to stabilize an unstable system. And of course, we didn't have macroeconomics in the 30s and the 19th century. So it's not a sine wave. We have policies and whatever that you know mitigate these things. But um, it's, you know, circling back to secular stagnation, you know, it might just be that we're in a downturn in a cyclical, a long way, uh, cyclical downturn rather than an overall change in the trend. And I've jumped in here, Mike, with my uh, Minsky model, which I've redone with different uh, uh, behavioral functions behind it uh, in my next book. And notice there are long cycles there. And I first saw this back in 1992 when I first built my model of Minsky and in financial and stability hypothesis and included government spending as a counteracting, countervailing force. And that gave me, as you can see quite visibly, long cycles and short cycles with absolutely no long-term dynamics in it. And the intriguing thing about your story, I'll just uh, shut down my, 
my sharing the screen now if I can do that. The intriguing thing about Forrester making that deduction about his own model is that he himself knew that there could be long cycles coming out of only short-term short -term relationships. So I'm rather, rather surprised. I think he probably freaked himself on that front because if you, and you obviously have read most of all of Forrester's work, I'm sure, when he's talking about his reaction to economists and the garbage they produced back in the 1950s, which is better garbage than they serve up these days, by the way, what he said was short-term dynamics can cause long-term cycles. Uh, and and the and the and they the, they get the wrong time dynamics and the, the whole thing anyway. So that's quite a tragic story that he. I mean, I, I wondered what happened to that model because I've always wanted to see that model become part of the discussion. And Ty, as you might know, is working on building a similar model. And Ty, I'm going to out you here uh, using Minsky, and he's already done it, and he hasn't sent it to you yet. And his reason is he doesn't think you would like it because we don't have capacity to show dominant. Uh, loops in, in Minsky, but I think you should send it to you anyway. Oh, we'll take a look. Yeah, a couple other comments. Um, Joseph Schumpeter <laughs> believed in long waves, and so did Hyman mm. Minsky. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was on a panel with him once, and I, I had a model that produced a long wave, and he said, oh, yeah, so I have some models that do that. He said, keep going, kid, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Jay, what happened to Jay's model? So, Jay, uh, it's been written up twice in two-volume books, once, and then he redid it. But he got so distracted in his older years at K through 12 system dynamics education because he felt that that was the future of the field, getting the, the kids to do it, not okay. trying to beat up on the economists. So he, he basically stopped working on the um, on the national model. And then um, his, a couple of his students who are friends of mine, um, Khaled Saeed and Bob Everline, um, Jay kind of willed it to them and said, you know, here it is, do what you want with it. And they've said, we can't decipher his thinking enough because his yeah. equations are a little, you know, non-transparent. So they're going to do something with it, but it's doubtful that it's going to be published at his because they can't really explain his, his thinking. So, um, yeah, so that's that, where that's that stands. One. In terms yeah. of, um, macro models, system dynamic, yeah, I'll take a look. Yeah, we'll, Beauty. Weigh in on on. So things. there you go, Ty. I've outed you. Yeah, the, um, <laughs> we had this we had this conversation on email earlier today. For me, uh, internet nirvana would be where the stock flow consistent people and the Minsky people and the SD people who do economics get together yeah. and learn from one another, because we all don't know everything, right? And yeah. and I just think if we work together, we can produce much better models more insightful models. We have the ability to incorporate the economics profession or totally avoid them if we want, put our models on servers, invite the public, the news media, the business community, whatever, make games out of them, let people run the things in a user-friendly fashion and discover insights on their own. And that might be the way to avoid some of this, um, you know, narratives about austerity and, you know, and, yeah. Fallacy of yeah. composition. I balance my budget. Why shouldn't the government? You know, all that stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Hey, Eric, yeah, um, how are you using system dynamics, um, and in particular, um, the tradition of Forrester in your in in your classroom and in your? I mean, you teach undergrads all the way up to I think four hundred level classes. Um, can you give a brief overview about what you're doing, what you're leaning on, what literature kind of overlaps with what Mike's uh, re referred to here? Mm -hmm. So in my teaching, I do not use system dynamics. Um, I have actually thought about doing it in an advanced macro course. The main hurdle to that is uh, there is so much to bring in, bring up front in terms of just the techniques and learning the basics that you lose a lot of time. I think I'm going to I'm going to interject there, Eric. Taken, uh, huh? Eric, I, I think you should use Minsky for that because, frankly, your work is completely compatible with what Minsky is capable of doing with the godly tables. So I'm going to twist your arm. Please have a crack at using Minsky. See if you can set up some of your arguments there. And students don't even if they use godly tables to make the model, they don't even know they're doing differential equations because the godly table itself generates them. So you can actually put a large amount of it together. And just even just to use it to show government finances, that alone would work. So I, I completely yeah, agree about Venn Sim, the, and the so they'd be course, the advanced yeah. macro course is more a seminar class where students get to learn the skills and get yeah. to talk about broad topics of macroeconomics. 
So um, I think uh, if we are there at that level, they, they would need to have a class, a system dynamics class to at least get the basics. Otherwise, it takes too much of the course, of the course. in the first so what, place. Yeah, I agree they, with Eric. They don't so the way I handle that problem, yeah. the way I yeah. handle that problem, I teach nuts and bolts system dynamics courses. And I tell the kids, if you want to learn how to build the car, take those. If you say, I don't care about building it, I want to drive the car to do stuff. In the macro courses, I turn all of my models into simulators, into games. Mm. So, all, so we go through and we look at the loops and stuff and the basic theory and the ideas, starting with Adam Smith and going through Marx and Schumpeter and Keynes to, all the way to Romer and whatever. But then they go in a simulator and they just move switches and buttons and levers and stuff and they can run policies and look at the feedback relationships and they don't have to know any of the math or whatever. And I say, if you do know the math and or can take the nuts and bolts classes, all the better, but it's not required. If you can do arithmetic, you can study the macro mm -hmm. models with the simulator. Okay. And, and I think the but, same thing. That's a lot of work. Turning every friggin' model yeah. into a good simulator is a, is a lot of work. So uh, Well, yeah, you know, Minsky but, makes it much easier. I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm pushing my product here, but Minsky makes it much easier. And like Eric, I'll send you a couple of papers they've just written where I, for example, show what the you know, what I call Fisher's paradox: the more debtors pay, the more they owe. Showing that if mm -hmm. if, if, if debt if you have a uh, and I'll, I'll use that to parody uh, Bernanke's argument. Bernanke said that uh, pure redistribution, so debt deflation, should have no significant macroeconomic effects. So I set up a Minsky model in about ten minutes, uh, where I sh I showed debtors repaying outstanding debt starting at the level of the uh, of the Great Depression. And then if you had loanable funds being the real world where savers were lending to uh, to uh, borrowers, uh, then the debt repayment had no particular effect on the economy. You rapidly, and I'm in like 30 seconds, change it from being bank, uh, the debt being the asset of the savers to debt being the asset of the banks, run with exactly the same conditions and GDP falls faster than debt and you get debt rising, the more debt is paid, the more they are. So, I guess yeah, I'm just twisting your eye, but you're, you're, you're be open you to it. If you want to present a model, then, then I can do that. That's that's fine. But uh, this class would be more geared toward being hands-on, and they build their own model. I think that's so because to be able fast. to do that, yeah. you, have to, you have to start earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so just yeah, mentioned, you mentioned, Stephen mentioned Urban Fisher. I, I have the graduate students read his 1898 paper where he introduces the concepts of stocks and flows into economics. Hmm. And I say, economists have known about all this for a long time. Uh, he was, he <laughs> was it's exceptional. Only, it's I only mean, today where we're, we're using this stuff, you know, effectively. This is, this is Ty's model, by the way, putting up the background there. So while that one's there, I'm going to see if I can load one from Fisher because uh, Irving Fisher is a remarkable human being uh, who wasn't just a, an economist who wrote, you know, typical garbage that economists write. He was a tinkerer. He designed the Rolodex. I think I mentioned that more than once. But in his, he actually built a mechanical model for, for working out general equilibrium in the 1890s. Hmm. Literally had a mechanical model. Yeah. So, um, uh, Paul he, Samuelson called that the greatest doctoral dissertation in economics ever written. Yeah, wow. and that's very true. Yeah. The, the uh, other guy who's like that in the genius box is uh, Bill Phillips from your original. Yes, uh, definitely. Neck, neck of the yeah. woods there with the Phillips machine and his uh, uh, hid controllers and macro. and. Very I think you have to, um, guy. for Fisher, though, you have to uh, remember that the Fisher of the pre-1930s is quite different from the Fisher. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you look at the pre-1930s there, um, Thorstein Veblen has had quite a nice critique of his uh, theory of interest rate, okay? Where uh, it's a, too much of a theory based on a, a classical view, a view of interest that is founded on production and productivity and that ignores oh, yeah. capital gains. And um, so, that, that was a major critic of his. And uh, when you look at um, the uh, publication of his paper, so the backstory for, me, for Fisher, for those of you who don't know, is that in 1929, uh, I think it was like August of September, he was on the radio uh, and telling everyone that the 
stock market will keep going up and it's uh, as bright as the future can be for a stock market. So please invest. He himself invested a lot in the stock market. And when the crash came, not only lost his reputation, but he, he was ruined. He had to sell his house, go live with his hand. And so that led to uh, quite uh, uh, quite a lot of thinking. <laughs> and so to think, try to yeah. figure out what, what the heck happened, what did I miss here? Yeah. And so, I, I think um, I think Fisher would have been homeless, but Yale rented him a house. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, no, not just so that. He's, in 1932, yeah. he published this paper. Okay. Uh, and then in 1933, the book, uh, and uh, in there, he, he, he um, recognized that Veblen brought forward a lot of the things that basically he's already talking about, that he talks about in the book. So Fisher got a lot of the credit, but if you look at Veblen, he actually wrote basically everything. On the, <laughs> on the other hand, Veblen lived in a tent on the midway at the University of Chicago. So <laughs> <laughs> these guys yeah, had so housing challenges. <laughs> so the, yeah, I mean, there's, some sort of, there's something romanticized just... about the about the, the 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 austerity of some of the academics. We all know the the freezing rooms that Marx was in to try and scribble out, you know his, uh, his you know his genius on paper, uh, regardless mm -hmm. of whether you're a fan or not. Uh, countless academics seem to have produced some amazing stuff. Uh, under pressure and with minimal amount of resources, it's it's very it's very interesting. I, well, the thing about Veblen, if just a comment there, Veblen, brilliant guy, insights left, right, up and down. I agree absolutely with Eric, but he is the hardest person to read. At least I found him as a student. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah have to have yeah. a page again and again. Like, what is the man with you, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, Eric, talk, talking of talking of another friend of mine, we've got to get Jamie Gold back on here one of these days because Jamie tries to channel Veblen quite frequently. And yeah. Veblen didn't only swallow a dictionary; he invented a couple of his own as well. So the words okay. that he can get into are crazy. And two people I think are most affected in current literature on sort of having swallowed too much of Evelyn. One is Jamie, but he makes a lot of good sense as well. And the other is Philip Murawski. And Philip Murawski's books are, I think, are about 80 to 90 percent larger than they need to be because of, because of the number of, of, of phrases he'll use and attempts at Evelyn. I like Phil a, a lot and I like his work, but, uh, you know, Veblen yeah, pulled it he off. He was an ND when I was an ND, yeah. Yeah, Ve Veblen pulled it off. I mean, you, you, theory of the leisure class and various other papers like that, even though there's massive amounts of verbiage in there that may be unnecessary, some of it's remarkably colourful and powerful. And uh, and and Veblen, you know, one of the great thinkers. But Fisher, on that point of about Fisher, Eric, um, Fisher's. I mean, if you look at what he did. He he, he accepted mainstream theory. So what he did in the 1890s was you know, build a mechanical model of well rise general equilibrium, which itself was incredible. Then he tinkered and made the Rolodex, is where his wealth came from. Uh, but of course, he set himself up. If you, if you and I have both read the theory of interest, but in that he he makes two assumptions to make the supply and demand analysis, which is what he was converting across to finance, to to fit. Because you know, when you buy an apple, you eat an apple straight away. When you buy a loan, you've got to pay it off over time. So you see, he made two assumptions. First of all, the market is in equilibrium at all times. Mm -hmm. Secondly, debts must be repaid. Now, of course, he breached both those conditions dramatically with his own life experience. And when he wrote, the, and I think that's one of the great papers people everybody should read, is the debt deflation theory of great depressions. And a critical part of that was rejecting equilibrium, saying that we may, you know, we may assume the systems tend towards equilibrium, but equilibrium will be met. Uh, the, uh, any equilibrium will be surely disturbed by something else. Therefore, everything must be above and below its equilibrium value. And thinking in equilibrium terms is what led him into financial ruin. So the yeah, official learned from his mistake and, and wrote brilliant stuff about it because having been listened to when he was talking the bubble up, he wasn't listened to on the other side. And of course, economists yeah. forgot, forgot the... Um, Forgot all the all the insight that that Veblen that, that Fisher obtained through that catastrophic experience. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna skip past uh, Migsies here for a minute because we've got you know six minutes to go, and I'm actually gonna change things up and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna head towards wrapping the show up. Like I said, we only have five minutes, so I got 
I got prompted with no warning to talk about dad jokes, and I do have one. It's an anecdote, but as I do, <laughs> as I, We're I know they don't, dad you know, joke on screen. Yeah, we, throw your dad jokes on screen. You know, it's guys. We're trying our best. We're going to get into more future episodes where we're answering some more questions. I, I actually thought the other day about how to actually do that, and maybe if we posted a, um, an email address, you know, send in your questions, and maybe we can feature it that way. It's hard to, to keep and really engage conversation, focus on a guest like Eric, and then also give everybody to turn in and still focus on the, on the, uh, but that's what the live stream is all about. So anyway, that's a good idea. That's a good yeah. idea. Onto the dad joke. So, um, and now not everybody in the room is a dad. Some are, some are granddads, but think about like an old man joke. Okay. So th the definition of the bad joke is you almost have to either explain the joke or people are like, Oh man, that's bad. Right. Okay. So here goes mine. It's probably one of the best awful jokes that I have. I remember uh, showing up at a party of debauchery and outside uh, bands up in the Whistler area on the Pacific coast of Canada. You know, there's bands playing everywhere. And uh, there's uh, this one fellow who's, he's, he's built like a tree trunk, right? And he's absolutely thick. He's just a thick, thick guy, but he's a, he's a fireman. And, um, you know, so I'm just chatting with him, you know, talking about whatever. And I said, hey, you know, you got some pretty massive calves there. Do you eat a lot of veal? R, R, oh. R, R. <laughs> and then, I, I preferred the one Douglas uh, did, did. I dreamt I was a muffler last night. I woke up exhausted. Very yeah, good. well, this, this, the, you know, this, this helper of the, of the community just looked at me and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky oh, we made up later, but yeah, just just to just shake his head and just put your lights <laughs> out. Yeah. <laughs> or if I was if he was trying to save me in a burning fire, he'd go up the stairs and then I'd say that he just to come back down without me. <laughs> the real You're Charlie own, buddy. And I, I ordered a chicken and an egg from Amazon. I'll let you know. That's pretty good. Give that marks. <laughs> Oh shit! Yeah, which came first, right? That's a nice yeah, one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, um, what do you what do you guys got to keep the 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 mood light and uh, the you know kind of like the denouement of the show well, wrapping I'll, up the last two I'll, minutes? I'll give, I'll give you one from. I was working. This is actually I heard this joke told by one very attractive young woman to another very attractive young woman uh, when I was working actually doing database programming in a publishing firm 50 bloody years ago. And she came, one of the, kind of dropped, dumped her bags on the ba on this and said to her friend, what have men in parking lots got in common? And the one that, I don't know, she said, when you get there, all the good sorts are taken and the only ones left are handicapped. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Eric, are you uh, are you known for your? I think I think I gleaned like a a youngster behind the door while we were sorting. You you, you have any embarrassing? No, eh? You're always okay. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll okay, we're gonna Dan, Dan yeah. circling back to something from our last show. Um, a question was asked about. I mentioned uh, a system dynamics model of mystic experiences and what have you, and I I did find the paper on that oh. so if anybody would like uh, me to send send them that paper let me know it's in pdf form and i'll fire it off hey guys a engagement transcends the show so yeah we're gonna you know like reach out we're all reachable you know you just consult the google oracle and you can reach out to eric or mike or steve and myself and um, I think our, our show producers are going to generate an email so we can get some advanced questions. The pressure's on the audience, though, because you got to think your question out. Well, I think you know, some of the answers we, have, we haven't answered today, that's a good idea. Let, let's try sk, sk and friends at gmail.com. Is that a feasible address? Ty will tie the maestro for the show, but I'm yeah. guessing sk and friends um, at gmail.com. So, Does that so work, Ty? Producer, producer in the background here is. What we're going to do is have a training seminar for you, Dan, and Mike on how to interact with the chatters on the live stream. <laughs> As this is a live stream, that's our main form of interaction. Um, I know it's hard for academics to do that because 
you're you're in a lecturing kind of mentality, uh, whereas a, a live event is a little more difficult to step into. Um, and it's okay on this show to get off topic. It's okay to interact with the chatters and sp- and steer the 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 topic matter in a different direction. So it's really about you guys being comfortable about stopping what you're talking about and going directly in uh, the direction of the comments in the chat. You have to remember, and this is to all due respect to all our great chatters, is most of them stay for about 30 minutes and then leave. So if they ask something and you never get to it, it's almost as if they've been rejected once they leave. So it's it's okay to go off topic on this show. That's actually what makes right. this yeah, show. True. That's what makes this show like four friends sitting in a pub, drinking some beers and just talking random economics. And it's fun, right? It's not a lecture. It doesn't. It never has to be a lecture here. So, yeah. anyways, that's all I got to say. Dan, we're at the top of the hour, so I'll close it out for us this week. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Daniel Sanderson, our beautiful host. And Eric Tamoyne, we're going to have you back again, buddy. You are beautiful. I love you. That's it. Julia, hit that outro. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>